So afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today, we're going to talk through Texas A&M International University's implementation experience, as well as lessons learned in adopting the um, EdFi EPDM starter kit. Uh, my name is Jillian Fenton. I am a director of business development here at Unicon that supports um, higher ed institutions in the state of Texas. Joining me today are Nicole Coda, who's a senior technical project manager here at Unicon, as well as James O'Meara, who is with the College of Education at TAMIU. And to get us started today, Nicole is going to give a brief overview of the EdFi Educator Prep Data Model Starter Kits. Thank you, Jillian, for that intro. One of the first things I wanted to do is just take a quick moment to go over the two different starter kits that EdFi has created for educator prep programs. So the first one's gonna be the Diversity and Persistence Starter Kit. What this starter kit's gonna include is it's gonna have some basic student uh, candidate demographics. So things like cohort year, um, gender and ethnicity. It's going to include candidate enrollment by program. So I can see how many candidates are enrolled in the different programs I've offered. And it's gonna include your candidate completers versus certified educators. So what that does is it takes the number of candidates who originally enrolled into that program, it then breaks it down by how many of those originally enrolled candidates went on to complete the program. Program completion is really defined by the school. So you may define it as they've completed absolutely everything from end to end. They're ready to become a teacher. Um, they've completed X, Y, Z of, uh, that they need to in order to go through and take their state certification. Um, so you're recommending them to the state. Other completers may be defined as if they're coming in for a specialized degree. Uh, maybe an enhancement to an existing teaching license or teaching credential they had. So maybe they just have to complete a set of courses in order to be defined as a completer. These are some of the conversations we get into, um, but it would be however you're defining those completers. And then your educators that went on to become state certified. So those are the candidates that have had successfully completed your program. You had recommended them to the state for certification and they went out and were successfully able to complete their state certification exam. This is a great one to start answering those questions in a really easy to use, elegant way. You can apply some filtering. So if I wanted to look at by program or by cohort year, that, uh, that ability is already built in here. The second one that, that's offered is the Clinical Experience and Performance Starter Kit. So it has the same candidate program demographic information what this one adds on, though, is it adds on the clinical evaluation. So these are going to be the evaluations that are conducted as teachers are going through different sim uh, simulations. Maybe they're in front of an actual classroom. It, it's where somebody is actually evaluating how they're doing against their expectations or the expectations of the institution that they're at. Uh, this is really, really good to start to see, you know, how are my candidates performing when they're actually put into those real world situations. And then the other thing that's also part of this is a, a candidate self perception. Uh, and that right there allows the candidates to provide feedback on the sense of belonging. Um, do they feel like they're being supported? Do are they do they feel like they're getting the the knowledge they need to be successful in the classroom um, and it allows the program to kind of see not just how the students are performing but also give you that insight to how they feel in the program do they feel like they can be successful do they feel like they have everything they need in their toolkit to kind of hit the ground running you know first day of school this one right here is a little bit more of a lift, and I think you'll hear James and I talk about it, but the whole entire reason why EdFi created these starter kits is it's a great foot in the door. Um, the data that's required to stand this up really is that core set of data. So, you know, information about the school, about the candidate, about the program. And it really is easy, especially with a lot of the support and documentation that's been created via the EdFi site. So I think this is a great chance for James to kind of get in there and share some of the experiences. You'll hear a lot of back and forth between him and I. Our whole entire goal is to really inform and, and help those that, that are looking for an elegant solution to be able to see educator prep program data 
in a way that's easy to use, consume, and turn into actions. You know, again, if I see that maybe my assessment planning, uh, you know, candidates just aren't scoring as high as I would expect them to, I can look for additional resources. The other good thing about this report is based off permissions, you can drill down. So maybe you want to look at not just at the program level, but maybe you want to look at the candidate level. You know, I mean, one of the things I love about the teacher prep programs is everybody is very close. So everybody in the office knows every one of their candidates' names. So you can sit there and you can say, you know, how is so-and-so doing in these areas? And then you can reach out and have that conversation with that candidate to figure out, you know, what's their secret to being so successful? Or, you know, um, where can the program provide more support? Um, so with all that, I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. Jillian, if you want to go ahead and queue up our first set of conversation. Um, so as mentioned previously, we're going to be talking through um, the EdFi TPDM platform data model and what some of the best practices are for implementing. So with that, James, I'm going to pose the first question to you was how did you prepare at your institution um, and research um, implementation for the EdFi TPDM data model? Hey, thanks, Jillian. Well, I think the first step was getting the right people around the table. We started with building a team. And I, I think Nicole's got a nice picture that we could share that really captures some of the, the work that we did in terms of team building and what we had to do in terms of understanding where all our data was and what data we need to be found. As we talked about in the introduction, uh, we're often data rich but wisdom poor. And what that means is that we had lots and lots and lots of data everywhere, but not too many people were using it. Right, so, so it's understanding the data and, and to make informed decisions. 100%. And if you look at that nice diagram there, the same dots for data could be used for the same dots for team members. We had to look across the university and probably more importantly, beyond our, our walls and our offices to find out who we needed to talk to, to find the data we needed to start really building some information about our candidates and in our case about the experiences of our field can candidates. So one of the things, James, that we did kind of early on is we started talking about the data that was needed to meet the EdFi requirements. Mm. Um, and one of the things we saw across the board was that the data doesn't live in a single system. You're not going to be able to go to your SIS and get everything you need, just mm. like you're not going to be able to go to the systems that maybe sit on the program side. So those dots also helped represent a lot of those additional systems. And right. one of the things that I think led to some of the success your team was able to, uh, to see was the fact that you pulled in some of those different resources from those systems. So that way, as you were talking about the data, you understood the meaning of it and the reliability of it. Um, you know, one of the common conversations we had was an admin date. You know, do you mm. use what's inside the SIS and what, how do you then treat those kind of reentry students? versus maybe a program entry date that has a lot more meaning for you guys. Mm. So I think, you know, seeing all that data in all those different systems kind of helped you build the right team in order to help lead to some of that success. Agreed. And I think, you know, one of the dots that was probably not on the screen that came on the screen was actually Ed Pye. You reminded yes. me just as a conversation, um, the educated preparation team had to get move into the EdPi world. And there was a whole language and glossary there. And so when we talk about team building and lifting, the first part of the team building was actually starting to speak the same language and getting some shared understanding about what it meant to be admitted, which meant something in the teacher prep world, which meant something totally different in the database. So I think that's a key word. We, we spend time together in team rather than on the project and really have a dialogue. And that dialogue to reach a shared understanding of what we mean when we say a certain thing and ask those questions. Is the data available? Do we have it? And nine times out of 10, we had it. We just really weren't using it for understanding. We we're mainly using it for reporting, which I think um, wasn't so much an issue of capture, but it was actually an issue of interpretation and use. And one of the other things that we did see kind of as we were going through there and identifying that those source systems was the file cabinet files. So when we're talking about, you know, really uh, building out the right team, 
you had team members that were willing to sacrifice their time to kind of take those paper files and turn it into something electronic that could be ingested. Um, so, you know, it's not always those high level program directors. Sometimes it's just having, you know, people that are, are invested in the outcome and willing to do the hours, I'm going to say, um, your team has spent. <laughs> I was all weeks. So I think we don't want to scare folks. So to be honest, what we did, we went into this filing cabinet. It's almost in some ways the data room here down in Texas. Having a data room and a double lock secured room was a point of pride. Until you start to get some folks from the outside saying, well, what are you actually doing with that data? Oh, well, we have it ready just in case someone comes down. But how's that helping you better understand how to support and better resource your program. Great question. And so we started to think about this. And as we started to look in, and it was really funny to watch some mornings at those huddles, those weekly check-ins, the looks of the on the faces of your team is like, wow, so you've got a hundred bits of paper. Do you realize per student, do you realize this could be automated in, in a heartbeat, be uploaded onto an Excel file that you could actually use? And that's when the light bulbs started to come on. Exactly. And that's the other thing is when you're kind of talking about those early first steps when you're looking at mm -hmm. it, you know, building the right team, part of that is identifying those source systems. And then the next piece is, is, is making that data manageable, accessible and usable without needing that human piece. So the automation conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, that was one thing that you saw with the, what the lift was from the evaluation that made you guys uh, reevaluate maybe the way you were doing surveys. Oh, 100%. Um, often the surveys and the data we're receiving was post, post the experience or in the case of the state data, sometimes up to a year later. So we saw the impact, but really couldn't control the outcome. And so this was really exciting, the idea that we could collect and unpack data, real-time data, and do something, especially in the case when the outcome wasn't the outcome we were hoping to achieve, not only for the college, but more importantly for the individual. I think that's one of the powerful aspects of the, the dashboard. You can take the 30,000 foot level and see the college as a whole, or you can go down to an individual and see, for example, what Nicole Code is doing in her field experience one. And with it being automated, that more real time, because now you're not asking people to do, you know, it data input for weeks, every two, three weeks. Now it's something that the data is just going to flow through your dashboards refresh. And now you see the latest and greatest uh, based off either your clinical evaluations or your candidate per, uh, self perception type surveys. Yeah, and I think that's another piece we had to discuss and, and really get our heads around. As I said, while there was language in the database and really mapping out each of the codes and each of the columns in the in the back end of the database, there was also this world of educator prep, which I think your team was coming into and seeking to understand. So I think initially we thought, um, and a lot of information systems, these, these nightly updates and the you know data refreshes, where here in Texas, what we look is, three areas, uh, the check-in, which is roughly about three weeks into the semester, the check-up, which is about midterm, and then the check-out. Now there's, especially in field experience, you'll see data coming in um, after the week three or the week six, and then really getting around the table and looking at that. That's much more powerful than going into a double locked file room, opening up the cabinet and pulling out a hundred pieces of paper and trying to see what's the pattern or what's the insight there. Um, so. Again, this idea that there was a different pace between, I think, the, the design team and just understanding the colleges of ed. But now that we're starting to spend more time together, I think we're starting to understand each other in terms of what the needs are of an educator preparation program, which is basically how does how is someone candidate A, B, C performing in clinical teaching or field experiences? And what do we need to do differently to either change our program, change the support, or leverage some resources from the district to start to shift the outcome, especially if it's going in the wrong direction. And James, I think you have some really interesting um, stories that you're gonna be able to tell sure. um, about kind of what, um, what you guys as a team did to make <clears throat> this successful. Um, 
some of maybe the things you've heard from other colleges that were looking at trying to do the same thing. I know you had a great story that you were able to share with us. You don't have to use any names um, about just another institution that was trying to go ahead and adopt it. And they were going, of course, you know, for the full model where the starter kit really became that more foot in the door, a lot more mm -hmm. easier to digest, right? Yeah. Um, especially since you, uh, you know, uh, Tammy, you did go in for the, the more difficult starter kit. So unbeknownst to us at the start of the conversation, I think that if there's a warning for anyone, full disclosure at the start of the, the projects, no one told us it was the hardest one, but we, we'd be really glad that we did actually take it. That was good. Well, in the first one, you know, the program diversity and persistence, that right there kind of gives you what your candidate makeup is when you're talking about gender, um, ethnicity, program mm. enrollment. Um, and and um, it, it allowed us to see those certified versus completers. So, you know, uh, then when you add in that evaluation, I know adding in the evaluation um, instantly showed where there was a, you know, um, a, a loss of a candidate or are missing eight as we decided to name them, uh, which was a great way to kind of start talking about um, what all it meant you know, as they were going through, because you at that point, that was early within the first three weeks, you're going through and evaluating them. Um, why were you losing those candidates? So I think putting the data together and going for the harder one instantly showed you kind of where that gap was versus just your your uh, candidates that completed versus your candidates that went on to get their state certification. And that's one of the big tests of, of designing a dashboard. I think that was one of the great things of having a starter pack because if you're building from the ground up, you don't know what you don't know. And I think one of the big dangers that I've seen uh, when I've talked to other folks about their efforts is that they try and transform the reporting mechanism they have in their college to a dashboard. And this is not what the dashboard's about. The dashboard is for insights. It's, it's to help you understand. And so what we were able to do really quickly, and we're talking 20 weeks from start to finish, was to create visualizations that started conversations. And I think that's the main purpose that you start to look, and you know, I've heard the example of um, Metropolis and Superman flying across and he, he sees something. And that's what the dashboard does, you see something. Could be a bit of smoke there, is there fire? Oh, it's worth a dive down. And, and, and that's really what the dashboard for us is enables us to do, to look at the big picture and then through the um, individual view, start to see if there's something going on there. It also gives you some insights into that connection between clinical and the university. In other words, we think our students are doing a job or sometimes we hear our students need certain things. And so we look for the data to see, well, where is it not occurring or where is it occurring and what do we need to do differently? And I think in terms of the visualization, um, there's some you, there's some great stories to be told in terms of what can we learn from this, and once we've seen what we've seen, what's our what's within our control to do something about it. And so coming back to that idea, the starter kits, you've got to put your draw a line in the sand somewhere and say let's make a start on a culture of inquiry at the campus, and that's what we did, and it gave us this framework to say well. What are we seeing here? And if you look at the sample dashboard, I think the first thing that you spoke about was that when we put this together, we saw 122 candidates in that top left-hand corner, but there was a number gap between 122 and the 114 that are in that bottom window or pane of the second column. Yeah, and I think this is a great uh, slide for us to kind of look at, to talk yeah. through some of those um, experiences, lessons learned, yeah. and the types of conversations you were having. Sure. Um, so we can go ahead and kind of keep this up and let's go ahead and let's start chatting about some of this. Um, when we're talking about kind of those data conversations we were having, um, you know, besides just determining what, what, how do you define a cohort or how do you define a start <clears throat> date or an admin date? There was other things like you're certified versus not certified. You know, those mm -hmm. were conversations we were having is how, how do you declare a student done within the program, which may be different 
based off what they're going in for. You know, maybe a graduate's treated different than an undergraduate, or maybe it's, you know, they're going in for some kind of specialization, where maybe it's not that they've graduated the university, but there's other things. So I think sharing some of the conversations that your team mm -hmm. had about the about what the data means to you is is really interesting. Yeah, I guess if we just start from left to right and down the columns, you said the first question was, well, how do we define the cohort? And a great conversation around that was, well, well the admission date seems a really straight identifier there. And so here in Texas, within seven days of uh, the formal admission date, you must report to the state how many students are in a certain certification area. So that was a natural piece for us. But again, this isn't about reporting and compliance. It was actually for understanding. So we have a snapshot um, here where it was, okay, for that period, and it was this uh, cohort of 2018, our total cohort was 122. Now, if we were doing interactive and, and sliced it down, we could see the blend of the different certifications. So that program had us, it gave us a look to see, well, what's the pipeline like? So there's a bit about understanding of the development, but also for the faculty conversations, well, how many are actually in my program seeking my certification? This is really important for deans and also for program faculty down here. We, our number one pillar in our strategic plan is empowering faculty uh, for visionary programs. And the way you do that is you empower them with data. And so you can start to see the faculty have, would have access to this. And we, we sit down once a month and have our educator preparation meetings where instead of having in this one event, the data day, now we've got an opportunity for regular data dialogue about the cohort that's coming in. And we can also see in this 218, this was chosen because we had a full cycle of data, how many completed and how many completed certified versus non-certified. And that's a certification. This is really important for us because we needed to see how many people came up with the dream of being a teacher and we'd actually said they'd be ready to be a teacher and they actually weren't. Now, just to be clear, some of the non-certification data there is that there's a, a praxis or what's called a PPR, Professional um, Pedagogical Responsibilities, and some students take that after the graduation date. And so that's where that came up. But it, also that gave us a bit of an insight as well. If we want to support our students all the way through to classroom ready, we need to have a look at our program to say, well, maybe we should require them to complete their program requirement um, as part of a course. Now, in Texas, we can't hold someone back on a certification exam, but we can try and provide this opportunity to support, especially the at-risk students, all the way from the day they come into the program to the point where they're recommended for certification. It's an interesting one as you think about race and gender. Um, no, well, one of the surprises probably for those outside of uh, Laredo and maybe outside of Texas, we are a very a highly Hispanic program. And so you can see there Hispanic 104 and then other 10 um, really gives an indication of who we are. And so when we start to look at our dashboard, what we're looking at now from an equity point of view, which is often a very important piece is not so much increasing the number of candidates who identify as Hispanic, but it's actually looking at their locations. And so one of the things that we, that's generated us to think about is, wow, what would it look like if the slice of the pie rather than candidates by race was candidates by high school? So we start to look at where the neighborhoods and the high school, the feeder high schools of the students coming from. Just to give people here on the, the webinar an indication, 90% of our candidates go back into community and so it's really a grow your own for a city of 276,000. And a, a school districts, when you put the two together, it's either the eighth or ninth largest school district in Texas um, at around 70, 75,000 students. So it's a significant population generating a significant number of teachers that go back into the community. So understanding the candidates in terms of their race, and I think our next step would be where they're coming from. And you can see they're not, too much of a surprise globally, it's a normally about an 80 20 split, or in this case, 88 12 split, male to female. And so, one thing we are looking at down here is uh, we see teacher education as a pathway to mobility. And so, we should, if we're talking about equality, mobility for all, um, which includes 
male and female candidates, we've got an interesting dilemma or one of the musings that's come out of this. Somehow the districts have ended up with roughly a 50-50 split in gender, which tells us that alternative certification or other pathways to the classroom other than the traditional route is how some students and uh, sorry, how some teachers are finding their way to the district. Oh, I was going to say, and that is interesting to kind of <clears throat> see that, you know, when you're looking beyond just the college, what that, what that uh, on infield type makeup looks like, because it does mm. start to, you know, it does start to churn those additional questions of um, how are those students that maybe aren't going through TAMAU getting there? And how could you uh, enhance the program to be more attractive to those? Because I know TAMAU, you guys are, you know, have one of the lower um, financial, like, yeah, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, Tuition, maybe? Yes, that you yeah. guys, the students oh, live the with debt, less the debt. debt. Yes, right. there yeah, we yeah. go. Yeah. So, I, you know, it's definitely interesting and an interesting selling point when you're trying to talk to candidates is. Uh, understanding those those other alternative routes. I think this again, you just highlight another benefit of really using this data informed approach. When you start to think about um, the tuition, which is where the, I think the third ranked third lowest in terms of cost for the student and then debt. Um, so a very affordable college with a very um, high level of acceptance. So you've got limited resources financially being generated from tuition and attracting a wide variety of students, some of which wouldn't be accepted in other universities. So you've got this challenge of optimizing success with the resources available and a, and a lower than average than typical um, tuition fee. So you start to think about why it's important now to start to get down to the individual level, which is really that on the bottom left there, the view of evaluation detail, I can drop down to an individual to see not only their name, and our goal here is to know them by name, but more importantly, their need, and how we can tailor that support system and leverage resources if necessary to ensure that we can deliver on that promise of, if we give you access, we're gonna promote success and very personalized. And then that candidate certification status is really the mobility piece. So we talk about access, success, and mobility. And for us in, in the College of Ed, crossing the chasm, which is often a, a, word, a, a notion used in innovation, chasm for us is creating Hispanics, access, success, and mobility. And this is the idea of how do we create it for our Hispanic can candidates? How do we help them cross the chasm from access through to mobility? And the way to do that is data-informed support, just enough, just in time, and just what's needed. Now, I know one of the other interesting things is when you started looking at the ratings by objective and kind of yeah. how it was aligning to the feedback you were getting once the, the candidates were actually placed versus how they were doing during their clinical experience. Yeah. You so, know, so go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying if, if anyone that's um, watching the, the, the webinar now or in the future that's a teacher educator or connected to the teacher education program, if you had any conversation with your partner districts, the one question you are you ask is, you know, what can we do better? And the answer is typically, ah, they need more preparation with classroom management. Management, management, management. Well, if you look on that uh, rating by objective and then down to the learning environment, 3.1, 3.2, and you see that most of our candidates were developing and proficient there was no one that needed need improvement. Now you might think about that if they were the seniors, but this is their first experience in their first field experience and no one in the cohort of 114 needed improvement in classroom discipline. And I'll just pause for effect there. So you can imagine the people watching this thinking, there's something missing here. Um, and that's, that really, to me, was one of the most powerful conversations we were able to have with our district and bring our district in. And then it started to really look at the need for calibrating feedback from our cooperating teachers, because if the data is saying that no improvements needed, then it's hard to justify. But uh, you know, there's a great um, saying which really aligns with the yellow and green there. 
if we're blowing sunshine, we're really not going to learn anything. And that's really what the feedback could, was that everything's good. No need, no need to do here. But the reality was that's probably not accurate. And so then you start to look down to, you know, this screenshots here's instructions. So if you think about these 2.1, 2.3, to 2.4, where you can see the, the lowest there again is um, communicating to, pro to promote deeper learning. And so then I'd go back to my curriculum and the folks in terms of uh, our differentiated instruction classes say, well, okay, how are we looking at this idea of deeper learning and how are we starting? To, what is it in the classroom that our candidates rehearse before they go out that could increase the likelihood of improving their communication and in a way that promotes deeper learning? So we start to have the same way as you and I had discussions around what went into the database these types of objectives, uh, which are aligned to the state objectives, so you get this consistency and we're all talking the same language, starts to give an indication of where we're at. Um, and again, a little bit of, an, not an alarm bell, but a point of curiosity. Um, if you think the, the ratings, either one, two or three, to have a 2.91 on your first attempt, that you can differentiate instruction um, and your, your students or the candidates formally informalizing, uh, formally analyzing and using student progress data and making adjustments. They, they, we've, we've done a pretty amazing job in terms of who we've selected because they've got pretty high ratings in instruction, um, classroom management. And uh, if we went down to planning, they don't look too bad as well. There's a lot of green in that first, you know, that first window on the, the third column. So now I do have a curiosity question for you. Sure. Prior to this dashboard being created, how would you glean that same information that just by looking at this, you can go, oh, I think we have a problem? <laughs> well, we'd go back into the, the data room and we'd pull the folders out and then we'd have to put them out on a big, big table uh, because by each folder has 100 pieces of information or sheets. I don't think you could. And I don't really think we were even looking at the, the formative feedback that we're getting here. Our main concern uh, was compliance. Did we have the folders there just in case? Yeah. And I think the transformation has been is, okay, we've got the data here and we've spent a lot of time collecting it. How are we, how are we gonna use it to, 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 to acquire some wisdom about what's working, what we need to start doing and what we need to stop doing? I could just imagine you, your team, uh, you know, surrounded by yellow papers going, okay, everybody go to page six and everybody, you know, scrambling to find all their page sixes. <laughs> well, I tell you, this was, this was one of the things, even I like the visualization. I can tell you the reality is that because the content and the completeness of a folder was evaluated, even for the, for the, the, the gatekeeper of these files to, to have those files out and risk that these folders, because there's also an order that you mm -hmm. have to have them in, I don't know whether even they'd be comfortable <laughs> enough to put them on the table, let alone spreading them out. Um, so really, we had data that we could access for uh, visitors, but we couldn't use for, for our, ourselves. Yeah. So the, I mean, that right there's another great reason why kind of doing the low investment starter kit is a good option because it does start surfacing that data that drives those conversations that drives you know change um, and change is a good thing in this in, in this type of conversation you know it could be program change it could be change for the support that you give your candidates um, it could be you know changing the way you recruit uh, you know especially when we talk about those next steps where like you had said maybe knowing ethnicity isn't as big it doesn't have as much value as knowing the communities and districts that they're coming from um, mm -hmm. I know one of the other ones we had talked about was the population makeup. Um, you know, what are your candidates interested in going in versus what the community need is? Mm. Um, you know, the music PE teachers versus, you know, the English history teachers. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, today, literally today, we have a career fair on another part of campus and there was six school districts who sent their HR team down to recruit teachers. And a lesson from the database was that we needed to understand what their needs were, which is sort of at the far at one end of the pipeline. And so at the dashboard prompted us 
to ask the question, are we meeting the certification needs? If we're really meeting the needs of the district, if, if we're truly, and we prepare 100% of the candidates within a 100 mile radius, 100% of is traditionally prepared, I should say, not the, not the um, alternatively prepared. And so it's a very big responsibility to meet the needs and start where the district is in terms of certification. So I've learned by asking the question locally that April is this great time when HR departments make projections. So then there today I was in the hall talking to HR departments. When do you make your projections? April. And we were just virtually going up the interstate of 35 from the radar all the way up um, just south of San Antonio. Everyone does the same day. Everyone's got the same data, but no one had actually thought to say, wow, wouldn't that be great to share with colleges of ed so they can track that they're preparing what you need? And then in the bigger conversation, we went to the Ed Fire Summit um, back at the start of the year to learn that the state has, within this ecosystem of data, has data about where the teachers end up in terms of mobility. Um, it really starts to get exciting then. And I think that's a good uh, way to kind of segue into our final outcome, with which is what you guys plan to do with, you know, the EdFi standard. Because the EdFi standard doesn't just do educator prep focused things. It, it actually has a bunch of other things that you can pull into your educator prep to look at staffing needs. What is that high school pipeline that have said they want to be teachers? Um, how could you influence maybe, you know, less music teachers, more English teachers in those early high school days? Um, there's the financial aid aspect which helps you kind of understand how your students are funding it. Um, you know, is it mainly grants? Is it, you know, through different types of state funding, that type of stuff. Um, there's also, I mean, there's a plethora of additional uh, data aspects that EdFi already supports that are used. I mean, it's, uh, especially within Texas, since it's a whole entire state adoption moving over to EdFi, um, that, you know, one day soon, you may have that early childhood education, you may have more insight into your candidates that are coming in, how they performed on some of those early markers that can indicate for uh, people within your program, uh, your department, uh, what kind of support systems may be needed for them. You know, we uh, we always talk about math. I'm one of those high anxiety math people I can easily agree with that eighth grade math rule. But really, when you look at high school transcripts, you're getting their freshman through senior year, you're missing that eighth grade indicator, um, adopting some of the additional EdFi data points that Texas is already there. Um, you now can start to see what that, what that candidate's eighth grade math looks like to determine mm -hmm. if they need that additional support. So James, mm -hmm. I know in talking with you, we have all these wonderful plans. I don't know if you're willing to go ahead and kind of go into kind of what that next step is for you guys. Uh, sure. Like as I said, we're accessing by accessing the data and starting for the starter kit. It just creates these, let's say, uncomfortable itches where you, you want to know more. Once you start to see the power of wisdom, you also benefit from the power of the questions that it raises. And so we started to look at well, what's happening with our candidates, and we 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 often work around three three tripwise. One's readiness. One is financial barriers, and one is um, birthright. In other words, someone, no one else in your family has been a teacher. So we're really looking at the pipeline, in, or, and actually they're pathways, they're not pipelines, there's multiple ways we become teachers. So we, we, we talk about these pathways. So our first initial step, we're still looking at in the preparation, uh, which is, okay, now that we've got folks who have been college ready, as in they're ready for TAMU, or Texas A&M International University, we've actually lost 50 or so students that weren't ready for the College of Ed. Their GPA dropped or they'd failed a course. And so there's an interest there and, and we're starting to look at a, a form um, using the form and the surveys around belonging, this concept or the contribution of belonging to student success. So when students are still exploring and then that pre-admission in their freshman and sophomore year, how can we start to track them in terms of are they feeling like they belong in the College of Ed and in teaching. And so that's one of the survey forms that we're looking at, tracking belonging as a, as a driver of retention and uh, 
really a strategy for ensuring that if we have the right mix coming out of the high school, we make sure that we don't alter the mix through attrition and dropout. The other ones we're looking at in terms of forms is confidence. So confidence about what? And this is, again, we can talk about these forms, but you've actually got to understand why you're asking the question, what's the answer it's going to help to solve? And so we're also looking at some innovative pedagogies to, to meet or high leverage practices to meet the needs of our community, with predominantly Hispanic, high concentrations of low SES learners, or learners from low SES backgrounds, I should say. And so when we start to talk about our signature pedagogies, how confident are our candidates in applying those pedagogies in, in field-based and clinical settings? So that's another survey that we're looking at. And then the third survey we're looking at is in terms of dispositions and this idea, and really a disposition, would our candidate do the things that they're suggesting or espousing they would do if someone wasn't watching, if it wasn't for assessment? And so the dispositional assessment is, is the third survey that we're looking at. So dispositional, belonging, and this idea of confidence with our signature pedagogy. These three. So it's definitely going to be interesting to kind of hear what you learned from those and what that drives you to do next. Because I know it's been, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to do it with you is because it's always so much fun kind of getting in there with you and talking mm -hmm. about data. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if, you know, other people are able to pick up on just your, you know, your and TAMIU's true reliance, deep understanding and deep love for data. I mean, yeah. you have you have a team that will get together over the weekend to do nothing but talk about data and maybe, mm -hmm. you know, see faces and things like that. But, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, it's great to hear and great to see everything that you guys have been able to do and kind of the way that you've been using EdFi to help move uh, your program and, and, and help your candidates be successful. Yeah, and I think, you know, for any, and especially the MSIs, um, the minority serving institutions that are, are listening or, or thinking about adopting EdFi, I think one of the things that really gives you is a, almost like a, a strategy positioning system. When your resources are, are limited and your needs are high, you really need to lean in on those data-informed decisions. Um, and this is something where EdFi's, and I, I've used the word before with you, uh, it's elegant simplicity. There's a lot of thinking work at the front to get the dashboard just right. But once you've got it right, the images or the red shadings or the, the pie charts, it just becomes self-evident where the issues are because you can see the pie chart or you can see the absence of red. And that starts a conversation. I think that's a really, that's the elegance part of it. You know, they talk about great artwork as having an impact on the viewer. And I think we could have dashboards that are, of lots and lots of dials that said we, we never really wanted to get to the stage where we we're trying to land a, a Boeing jet with 50 million dials and all the, the buttons. And so to getting to that point beyond complexity to elegant simplicity by having the dialogue, that, that's really the team building piece. And then getting something that works for you. And I think the real power of this, the, the starter kit is that you're starting with something before you start to build from the ground up and you know, we've spoken about some other teams that have tried to get where we got in 20 weeks over a couple of years and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, I can tell you for those that are, are asking the question or wondering the question, we had two, uh, two of our team members and two data analysts. And as, you, as Nicole said, put it up in 20 weeks. And, and most of the delays were actually access issues and security rather than the complexity of the task. Yeah, I think, you know, more boots on the ground, it was, you know, under 100 hours that the teams kind of really did allocate to getting the dashboards that you have now. And again, that was the harder starter kit. So, you know, you got to kind of pat yourselves on the back for that, definitely. Oh, we um, do that on a daily basis. No, I'm only joking, Nicole. <laughs> um, but, and then, you know, in all honesty, too, we, we've done a bit of the thinking because we were co-constructing. We had an idea what that dashboard would look like, but there was some iterations. And so in its current state, um, for those in Texas, mainly because of the, uh, the links to the, the state evaluation framework, it'd be a pretty easy one to grab and go with. And, but for those who are not, just holding on to the principle, and they talk about you know, the MVP, the minimum viable product, or in this case, the minimum viable dashboard as a starting point, and then tweak it 
as you go on. That's what we've really done. Let's start with the framework and then add things that we know are essential rather than tinker around with things that are nice and keep unplugging and replaying and yeah. rebuilding. I think just keep the, the main thing the main thing, and that's the main thing as I say. Yeah, and the good thing about the starter kit is you've already adopted the core, so everything after this is easy. I'm very wary when you say that after our first interaction where you didn't tell me that it was the most difficult thing, but I'm sure seeing we're on video and being recorded that it must be easy. Really. <laughs> but look at the power of the data and what it's doing for you now. It was so worth the investment. Oh, seriously. Like it, it's, um, and they say a picture paints a thousand words. In this case, the dashboards really starts a thousand conversations as people start to get into why and then the natural curiosity and, the, and that detail of you, well, well, what about Nicole? How is Nicole? Like, once you see the big picture, you can drill down and well, what's happening with the, the special ed specialization? Why are they outperforming the bilingual specialization? And so you can really start some of those conversations and really, once you start to automate this, and we're also talking with our institutional effectors so we can automate the reporting more often or more easily. So this really is just, not an, another task or another lift or another thing you have to get in by a certain day. But it's a conversation starter and really the start of a movement towards a culture of inquiry. Awesome, awesome. And Julian, I think we're gonna go ahead and pass it over to you. Absolutely. So, so James, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to you talk through kind of your personal implementation experience and your lessons learned. Um, you know, as, as you kind of went through the process of implementing the FIEPDM model um, and seeing that dashboard, it's like you said, it's, it's elegance, it's insightful, and it creates those actions that are impactful, right, for those learners and helping them through their educational journeys. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you should have any questions whatsoever about TAMIU's experience or how Unicon assisted TAMIU with implementing the EdFi EPDM uh, starter kit, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We do have our contacts listed here and we hope you have a great day.